the music that the people of this church produce is just always so beautiful and stunning. What giftedness we have within our congregation. We are in the eighth month of a global pandemic. Eight months for us in the Pacific Northwest. A pandemic that continues to wreak havoc throughout the world. Early on in the pandemic, I was checking a website called World Ometers every single day, sometimes multiple times a day, just to look at the statistics. Now I check maybe a couple times a month while still reading the Seattle Times every day and checking Pierce County Health Department periodically to see how the virus is impacting us locally and whether we could possibly move to the next stage or not. There have been times where I've been hopeful as the curve began to flatten, only to have those hopes dashed with a new uptick in cases. Worldwide, there are 40 million cases with over a million deaths. Our grieving minds and hearts cannot even comprehend these numbers. We've learned a lot about comorbidities and underlying health conditions and the potential long lasting health risks this virus can have if we contract it. COVID is now the third leading cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer. It has surpassed injuries, accidents, lung disease, and diabetes as one of the leading causes of death. The impacts of this pandemic are too numerous to count and they are enough to make non-anxious people a wee bit anxious, not to mention wreaking havoc with people's mental health. It reminds me of the line in the 1662 version of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. You all know the line, I'm sure you've got that Book of Common Prayer memorized. That composer John Rutter used in writing Agnus Dei. And the line is this, in the midst of life, we are in death. The rudder requiem is filled with darkness and light, despair and hope with major and minor keys, with jarring dissonance and sweet melody with death and with life. For some, the more discordant parts of the requiem speak with greater resonance for these dark days. And yet, the opposite is true as well. In the midst of death, we are in life. Listen to these words from the scripture. Deuteronomy 30, 19, I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings, therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live. From the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, I have come to give you life and give it abundantly. These verses are the premise of the book for our sermon series for the next six weeks. A book, The Leading Causes of Life, was written by United Methodist Pastor Gary Gunderson and United Church of Christ Pastor Larry Prey. Isn't that curious? We have a merging of a Methodist and a United Church of Christ Pastor. They believed that humans, if humans could focus more on what it truly means to live than that which causes death, that we would have more life abundant, to focus energy and attention on what affirms life rather than what destroys or threatens it. What ingredients make for a meaningful life? I'd be curious about your responses if you wanted to write them in the chat as we move through this sermon series. What ingredients for you make for a meaningful life? 
those things that bubble up from within us and through us that give us a sense of richness, fullness, and satisfaction that make up for what we might call from John 10.10, 10, an abundant life. One of the hymns from the New Century Hymnal that we sang a few weeks back is based on an adaptation by Hindu Upanishad's author Satish Kumar. The words are, lead us from death to life, from falsehood to truth, from despair to hope from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts. Let peace fill our world. Let peace fill the universe. These are great aspirations, but how do we do it? How do we live that out? Gunderson and Prey believe that there are five leading causes of life. I named them at the beginning and I will name them again here. Connection, coherence, generativity, agency, and hope. You might come up with a slightly different list, but this is a good place to start. So over the next six weeks, we will be focusing on these five leading causes of life, starting with connection. The editors of the Christian Century posed a question in the April 2020 issue. They asked, what does it mean to be church during a pandemic without gathering in person? Without being physically connected in a house of house of worship, like if you wanted to touch somebody on the shoulder during the prayers of the, the people or look around as we're singing and sharing a congregational hymn. They write, Christianity is at its heart an incarnational faith. Worship embodies the belief that God's grace comes through physical contact water trickling down a forehead in baptism, receiving the bread and the cup from another during Holy Communion, one person squeezing another's hand. While the closing of public worship doesn't mean separation from God, there is real grief around the suspension of these tangible forms of connection to Christ, to others and to the world. Like if you wanted to reach out and touch someone here on Zoom, it's tricky. And we have to find different ways of finding a source of connection with one another. Because humans are wired for connection and social interaction. We are social creatures. Some of us more social than others, but every one of us needs a touchstone of connection with another human being. Human connections are like a breath of fresh air on which our very lives depend. Capable of only brief episodes of solitude, human life thrives on our complex social connections to each other. I have to tell you that since the pandemic, we take regular walks in our neighborhood and I find that we're having more conversations with our neighbors because we just don't see as many people and we're finding a deeper bond and connection uh, with our neighborhood. This global pandemic has made most of us realize how deeply and inextricably connected we are to one another, like branches on a vine, like from our scripture from John 15. While sharing close physical connection in enclosed spaces, especially, has proven dangerous, sometimes deadly, it is crucial to our spiritual lives and to our mental health to still be connected, to have people know us by name, 
people we know care about us. Connection is a primary and leading cause of life. Episcopalian Bishop Michael Curry, you might know him better as the one who officiated at a royal wedding a couple years ago. He has a new book out called Love is the Way, and um, we could just look back a couple months ago when Bill Diamond brought us that message of what does it mean to love. Recently, Brené Brown interviewed Bishop Michael Curry in one of her podcasts. Bishop Curry said these words, we are cut off from the very sources that give us life. God is mediated through community. Human beings were not made to be separated from each other. We weren't made for that even when we are headaches to each other. We're still better off together than we are apart. We've been separated and it's causing deep anxiety. Brené responded, I go to church for three reasons, to sing with strangers, to pass the peace with people I normally wouldn't like or agree with, and to go to the rail, to break bread with people I need to understand better. That's how I find God in love. One of the scriptures Angie read this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. Let us keep encouraging each other and let us not, as some have done, forsake gathering together. Well, we're not able to gather together in a physical way that the writer of the Hebrews and um, the book of Hebrews imagined. But we have not stopped meeting and worshiping together. Amen. I have to say I am encouraged, even if a bit surprised, by the consistent number of, give or take, about 50 boxes that show up on Zoom every Sunday morning. Look around. We are not just boxes that look like the Brady Bunch, because each of these boxes represents a life, or two, or three, named and claimed as beloved child of God, connected to one another and to God like the vine is connected to the tree. Your reasons for coming to worship on Zoom, or if you find us later on Facebook or YouTube, may be different than the ones Brene Brown mentioned. But we are finding in these pandemic days how important it is to be connected together in Christ through worship. And I would say that most of us are surprised by how meaningful virtual worship has been and can be. Can I get an amen from out there? The root of the word religion is religar, religare, R-E-L-E-G-A-R-E, or ligare, or ligament. We know what ligaments do in our bodies, which means to bind, to connect together. Churches are places of connection. Churches can be places of wounding, but they can also be places of healing. Physical healing happens when two sides of a wound reach toward each other and bind together. Healing can happen for us when we connect to the source of all being, to the healer Jesus, who always guides us back to the heart of God, as well as to one another. And so we are connected A couple of the scriptures that Angie read, I want to highlight again, they're short. 
but so important. Ephesians 2, in Christ you are built, you all, we all are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Matthew 18, for wherever two or three or all of us on Zoom are gathered in my name, there am I with them. Romans 12, just as there are many parts in our, to our body, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of it and takes every one of us to make it complete for we have different gifts and we have a different work to do. So we belong to each other and each of us needs all of the others. When something happens and the challenge is great or the tragedy is almost too much to bear, what do we do? We look for people to pray with us and for us on our behalf because our prayers by themselves don't necessarily feel sufficient. We need to support the encouragement, the gathering of each other. There are testimonies through the ages that God sustains us in many ways. And one of the ways is connection with others. 50 years ago, the people who made up the congregations of Mayflower, UCC, and Aldersgate, UMC, looked at, at each other as friends who already knew each other, and also as strangers who took a risk trusting that joining and connecting together as one church community would make them spiritually stronger. And so, United Church in University Place came to be in January 1970, 50 years ago. What has kept you cut going these past 50 years? The two separate congregations that came together are part of two different denominations whose organizational structures are quite different. I would say the reason arises out of people who have a deep faith in God, and a genuine and authentic community who share a deep connection with one another and who truly enjoy each other. I like what Bill said, that he experienced the magic and the, the mysticism in our congregation. And we were witness to Bill and Vicki joining the church How God invites us to draw a circle that is ever larger than it was before and say, come, be a part of life. Come, be a part of something that will cause life within you, life that could be longer, life that could be richer and fuller. Where do you find your place of connection? What helps you to connect to the source of all being? What helps you to connect to one another? And I invite you to continue to write any reflections in the chat if you are willing and brave enough to do so. Having a faith community where people look, where people love, look out for, and care for each other, pray for each other, is one of the things that makes for a long, rich, and satisfying life. Connection is a leading cause of life. Amen. Thanks be to God.